Our first speaker is Lehman Kung Jr., who is a native of Honolulu, Hawaii, where he obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in animal science. He completed his PhD at Michigan State University in dairy science and is cur currently the S. Halleck DuPont Professor of Animal Science, which is an endowed professorship in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at the University of Delaware. Lehman has a research, teaching, and extension appointment and has led the department as chairperson for five years. His research has centered on ways to improve the productive efficiency of lactating dairy cows through a better understanding of fermentation processes that occur in silage and in the rumen of cows. His silage program has been recognized in the US and internationally, and he is sought after as a speaker at dairy meetings throughout the world. Thank you very much for joining us, Lehman, and I'll let you take the floor. Thank you, April, um, and Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Cornell Extension for inviting me uh, to make the presentation to, to uh, you all. And I'm going to try to take over the screen now, so give me a second. All right, so um, I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about wild yeasts in uh, silages and uh, TMRs, and we're going to talk a little bit about different things relative uh, to that, those topics, but here are the topics that I'm going to present today. First of all, we're going to talk just a bit about silage fermentation so you can understand what a good silage fermentation looks like. We're going to describe the roles of yeasts in silage. We're going to tell you why they're undesirable in silages and total mixed rations. We'll talk about negative effects on ruminant animals. And we'll also talk about methods to minimize wild yeast in silages. And then we'll end on just a slide or two talking about some things that we don't know about wild yeast because this is certainly um, a topic of um, a lot of research and we really don't know uh, very much about the whole process of what happens within the silo. So just to start off, um, I'd like to just remind people that uh, I try to look at it that there are um, four uh, major places where pe people lose dry matter and energy in a silage fermentation. And I'm going to try to annotate here. So let me see how this works. But um, you can see if you look at, um, oops, sorry, respiration, fermentation, seepage, and what we call aerobic instability, uh, which would be right here. And under good management conditions, respiration losses are quite low. So are fermentation, seepage, and aerobic instability losses. And for the most part, people talk about in a normal silo that's under good management, people will lose someplace about 10 to maybe 12, maybe 15% of the total dry matter that was coming out of the field. But you can see that under poor management conditions, these percentages of losses can increase substantially. And in fact, uh, it is not uncommon to find a, a large bunker or large pile silo that perhaps was uncovered or the plastic blew off where losses could be even greater than 20 or 30 percent. And obviously any percent loss here is a reduction to net farm income. So we want to keep these losses to a minimum. I think the, the main thing that I want people to take home from this slide is the fact that what I have highlighted in red here is that as you can see, uh, losses due to what I consider aerobic instability or aerobic spoilage, which can occur during storage and or feed out, can account for as much as 50 to 60 percent or even more of the total silage losses that occur in an ensiling system. And I think that this is not really well recognized by a lot of people. I think most people feel, oh, uh, you know, that the majority of losses in a silo are really due to fermentation. Uh, this could be true if you're going under some type of clostridio fermentation, but for the most part, if you in things like corn silage and high moisture corn, uh, more than 50% of the losses are probably occurring because of aerobic spoilage. Now, what's pretty important for us to, to start off with is to take a look at what happens in the silo under what I consider uh, ideal fermentation and good storage conditions. 
So I, I'm going to show a number of graphs that look like this, um, where I have two phases of fermentation. I've simplified this, the fermentation phase first and then storage and feed out. I have days in siling. I have component changes that are going to occur here and temperatures here. So the first thing that happens in a really good fermentation is that we get rid of the air in the system, right? We pack this material well, we put covers on it, we put plastic, um, and we do all the good things to decrease the porosity within the silo so that we can have a good fermentation. When we get the air out, this stimulates good lactic acid bacteria to utilize sugars. And so if you were to look at the silo over time, one would see the concentration of sugars decreasing in the silo because good lactic acid bacteria convert these sugars to lactic acid. Lactic acid is a very strong acid, so this affects the pH, which is an indication of acidity. There's also a little bit of acetic acid that's produced as well. Now, during storage and feed out phases, if we were able to maintain the anaerobicity of the systems, that is keeping air out of the silo during storage and during feeding, we create a really high quality silage that has these types of changes that are occurring within the silo. And that, as you can see, is basically nothing. So theoretically, when you look at silage fermentation, the goal is to try to get these changes in fermentation here that are occurring early during the ensiling period to occur as quickly as possible and then come to a steady, so steady state or plateau so that we can maintain these nutrients within the silo. There is, of course, a little bit of a temperature rise in the silo because there is some oxidation and uh, respiration and the heat of fermentation is occurring. But as you can see, temperatures increase and then eventually dissipate over, the over time. So the quicker that we can get our silages to reach a steady state and lower temperatures, the more dry matter and energy we're going to uh, save within that silage system. And as we progress through the number of slides that, that uh, I have here that are in this similar format, I'm going to point out uh, specifically uh, this region here where we see um, a flat line and very low temperatures. So this is what's happening in an ideal fermentation phase and good storage and feed out phase. Now, there are many types of microorganisms um, within a silo, uh, lactic acid bacteria, molds, uh, bacilli, aerobic microorganisms, clostridia, but we're going to focus on microorganisms that are fungi, and we're going to focus primarily today's talk on those organisms that are called yeasts. Um, as you can see, uh, this was a study that was done several years ago from my lab where we, we looked at silent samples from uh, New York, Idaho, Ohio, Washington State, uh, West Virginia. We looked at corn silage, and then this is high moisture corn here on the lower right. And you can see that all these little microorganisms names that have all these fancy names here, they're all different types of yeasts that occur in silages. And I think the one thing that you can see, because the colors and the bars represent different types of yeast, is that first, there are a lot of different types of yeasts in silages. And secondly, they're not always consistent across forms. And those two things are, are really um, a subject of a lot of research because we don't understand why there's so many yeasts and why they're so different among the different types of locations and farms that you might have, but that, that you might be at. But we know that this is a fact of life that, that we're dealing with. Now, we look at, when we look at what we call wild yeast and silage, there are really two types. Uh, first, there are what we call fermenting yeasts, and these yeasts are really happy when there's no oxygen within the system. If there's a, just a little bit of air, they're happy to convert sugars and make ethanol, carbon dioxide, and water. And this process is basically what's happening when people make gasohol, if you think about it. You know, you harvest corn, it goes into um, uh, the gasohol plant. They'll take this corn starch, they'll add an enzyme called amylase to convert the starch to sugar. They'll then add a yeast, and the yeast will chew on those sugars and ferment those sugars and make ethanol, carbon dioxide, and, and water. In that process, making ethanol is the goal. That's their end product. But there is a production of carbon dioxide. And one of the things that um, is important for us to know is that carbon dioxide 
represents a loss of energy and dry matter to the system because carbon dioxide is a gas and it goes up into the atmosphere. But this carbon that is part of carbon dioxide could have been converted into a volatile fatty acid or it could have been converted to some type of sugar that the cow could have used to make energy and make milk. So anytime that we end up having a lot of CO2 being produced within the system, whether it's anaerobically or aerobically, this is a negative aspect that occurs within the silo. It's a loss of dry matter and energy. So this is why when you look at the fermentation of glucose to ethanol by yeast, it yields only a 51% recovery of dry matter. So could you imagine that if you put uh, uh, 10,000 tons of silage into a, into a bunker silo and only got back 51% of the dry matter that you put in, that obviously uh, would be very undesirable. Now, yeasts are also able to metabolize aerobically under aerobic conditions. And there are certain yeasts that besides fermenting and making alcohol, not all, but some are able to what we call la utilize lactic acid, and they're called lactate utilizing yeasts. These organisms under aerobic conditions can oxidize lactic acid to CO2 and water. And this uh, leads to a loss of dry matter and they are the primary initiators of aerobic spoilage in total mix rations and in silages. And you can see a common thread between undesirable alcohol production and undesirable lactic acid utilization aerobically is the production of carbon dioxide, which again is the loss of dry matter and energy within our system. So why should we be concerned about uh, uh, yeasts and silages? Well, we know that yeasts are the primary initiators of the spoilage um, process. They can cause heating in the silo and in the feed bunk. They can, this can then cause reduced dry matter intakes. It can result in acidosis-like conditions that often result in depressions in milk production and depressions in fat tests in animals. Air is probably the worst enemy of silage in the beginning of, of fermentation. It delays and actually encourages the growth of these undesirable yeasts that uses nutrients for inefficient processes. And during storage and feed out, air stimulates the growth of these yeasts, these lactate assimilators, reduces aerobic stability, and as I had mentioned, results in nutrient and dry matter losses. So let's look at what happens in the, at the very start of fermentation if we have excess air. So as you can see, this graph has got the pretty much same format as the previous graph, but let's see what happens now instead of, of having no air in the system and getting rid of it, what happens if we have air uh, uh, lying around and a lot of residual air within the system? You can see that sugar content drops, but it doesn't drop as rapidly until uh, some time later in fermentation. Lactic acid does not increase as fast as it should. Acetic acid is doing some weird things. pH doesn't drop quite as quickly. But now if we keep air out of the back end of the system, we end up with a steady state. But what is most important in this graph, as you can see, is I draw your attention to the bottom is that we ended up with a really prolonged period of time of heating, which is producing CO2 and heat, which is a loss of energy and dry matter within the system. So we really wanna make sure that when we harvest our silages and put them in the silos, that we get the air out of the system. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a few slides. Now, Let's look at what happens under ideal fermentations, but having air in the system during storage and feed out. So I'm gonna show you no air, nice sugar decline, nice lactic acid in the, as in the first graph, pH drops, acetic. But now during storage and feed out, let's say that we expose this material to air. What do you think happens here? Well, this is what happens. And what, what have we done? Well, we have basically just destabilized the system.
So even though we've done a really good job of making good for silage here, we've blown the silage up because we've exposed it to air. And you can see there's a, what we call a secondary heating peaks that are occurring uh, later in the system and actually causing more dry matter and energy to be lost within the silo. And the question becomes then, well, we know that air has caused all these changes, but what are the specifics of why this actually happens? And I'm gonna tell you, first of all, before I, I, I answer that question, is that there is a misconception that things like molds that you see here, here are these green fuzzy molds and white molds and halage, molds are not the cause of this aerobic instability or spoilage. What is the cause is really the combination of having air entering the silage mass and then yeast that are the lactic acid utilizers waking up and degrading, these, uh, degrading this acid. Their numbers increase with time very quickly. They degrade highly degradable nutrients. Uh, they don't degrade nutrients, unfortunately, like they don't degrade um, starch, they don't degrade fiber, they don't degrade lignin. They, de they degrade sugars, really highly nutritious parts of the silage. During this process, because it's aerobic, they produce a lot of heat. The pH increases because lactic acid disappears. And then interestingly, a second wave of microorganisms that you actually now can see, like the molds and other bacteria, these guys now wake up because the system has been destabilized and they add to further spoilage within the system, causing massive spoilage. In a nutshell, if you were to look at this over time, this is a graph that shows that process occurring where um, this is um, increase in yeast. You can see they increase quite rapidly over hours of exposure. Temperatures increase <coughs> and pH increases. <coughs> and this happens to be um, uh, ambient temperature. If ambient temperature, even if ambient temperature is low, all of these things can, can occur quite rapidly. And of course, I know that you know that in spoiling silages, aerobically spoiling silages can reach temperatures as high as 140 all the way up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit and actually spontaneously combust. Uh, here's a, a, a temperature probe in the side of a, a, a pile silage that was reaching about a, almost 130 degrees here. And uh, we can use cameras, uh, near, uh, uh, heat sensing cameras. This spot, which was representative of right here within the silo, right there, was at 156 degrees Fahrenheit, a huge loss of dry matter and energy. And if you think about this spoilage process, having yeast and silage is really about the numbers. And the question is, you know, well, how do initial numbers of yeast affect this time to spoilage and how quickly does it spoil? Well, I'm gonna show you a theoretical graph here that shows a line of spoilage occurring here. And if we open a silo and expose it to air and we start off with a number of yeasts that are very high and we say, whenever these yeasts cross this line that's spoiled, let's just say that spoilage line occurs there at 12 hours. But if I had the same silo and I started it with a very low population of yeasts, they would grow at the same rate, but they would take more time to reach the spoilage indice, and that might be 60 hours. So hopefully you would not have silage within a, or a TMI of feed bump for more than 60 hours to have it spoil. But here in this instance, this material spoiled and was heating in your feed bump uh, in less than 12 hours, which is highly undesirable. So having lower numbers of spoilage yeast in silage and TMRs is definitely a good thing. And we're gonna talk, of course, more about how we can make sure that we minimize yeast in uh, silage and total mix rations. And here's the numbers game. Um, this is numbers of yeast, uh, numbers per gram of silage. So here's 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and a million and the hours of stability before it, this silage spoils. So as you can see, as I have very few yeasts and silages, my stability is very long. That means this silage would take 
over 160 hours to 200 hours before it's spoiled. And of course, nobody has silage in a feed bunk for that long, hopefully. Um, but one thing that you do have to remember is that silage can be exposed to air before it even gets into a total mix ration or into a feed bunk because air penetrates into the mass of the silo through the face and through the plastic, through the sidewalls, through leaks in, in the doors and the upright silo, through um, uh, challenges with uh, rips in plastic. So air certainly is, is an issue that we have to deal with. But as you can see, as we increase the number of yeast and silages, the stability goes down. Now, one thing that we all have to be cautious with is that uh, interpreting yeast numbers, especially as they come back from uh, the forage lab, and a common question that I always get are, are high yeast counts on the standing crop a problem? And I'm going to say that this is, this is a really uh, tough question to answer, but really the answer is no if the crop is well managed during storage. Um, and I'm going to say that because you potentially could have relatively high yeast counts in the field, but if you do a great job in the silo of getting it in, packing it, and minimizing the yeast within the silo, you'll lower those populations down so that they don't become a problem when you feed out. On the other hand, you could have very low numbers of yeast at harvest, but if you did a very poor job of management, you would end up with uh, silage that was really prone to, to spoilage in the feed bunk and actually even in the silo. And um, we know the other thing that's, that you should be aware of is that numbers of yeast and molds can increase dramatically during storage and transit as it's getting to the forage lab. And this is especially true during the summertime when temperatures are hot. Right now, probably not a big issue because it's really cold outside in that UPS truck or the, or the uh, postal truck. But certainly during the summertime when temperatures can be, can be very hot, yeast can grow very quickly. And I'm just gonna show you a really, uh, a, a small graph here that shows you that yeast can theoretically double in numbers every one to two hours. So this graph shows you that you could start with 100 yeast in a gram of silage. And if you were under optimal conditions, by the time you reached 12 hours, you could have almost more than a million yeast per gram within that sample. And certainly we know that samples are taking more than 12 hours to get to the forage lab. And so by 14 hours, we went from 100 yeast per gram, theoretically, to about 1.6 million yeast per gram. Now, what are numbers of yeast and molds in silages and, T and, uh, and TMRs? Well, for, this, for uh, simplicity's sake, I have some numbers here. Standing crop, you probably have about 100,000 to maybe 500,000 yeast per gram in the crop. That number can be higher if the crop is drier or if the crop is damaged by uh, earworm or hail damage or bird damage. Uh, anything that's going to physically affect the crop is probably going to increase yeast counts a little bit. In well-preserved silages, we really want to have less than uh, 100,000 or so, uh, and additives can actually help to decrease that start. Silos that are exposed to air during storage and feed out will end up with numbers in the millions, and I'll show you a graph in a second. But interestingly, there are some silages that have no yeast or molds in them. Specifically, silages that have undergone clostridia fermentation do not have yeast in them because butyric acid is a really good yeast killer, and that's a kind of an ironic thing, right? We can have really poor silage that's clostridial, and never heats, but it's spoiled a different way because it went through a bad fermentation. And those clostridial silages definitely don't have yeast and molds in them. Silages that are, have been stored, uh, let's say at the bottom of a cement stave silo that you haven't seen because you keep refilling and you never get to the bottom. Uh, if it's been there two or three, four or five years, by the time you get to the bottom, there's probably no yeast in that because everything's gone. It's probably pretty sterile. 
And in fact, quite interestingly, blackened layers at the top of bunkers or piles, uh, after some point, they're probably not gonna have any yeast and molds in them either because that material has gone through its process and there's really nothing left in there. The nutrients are pretty much gone, but the microorganisms are also pretty much gone as well. Here's a graph that I had borrowed from um, Ralph Ward uh, at Cumberland Valley uh, several years ago, and this probably hasn't changed. This is an old slide. I think it's like, it's probably from 2012 or so, but look at the distribution of these 700 samples. Uh, 30% had less than 1,000, which is, would be good. And actually, if you look at these, uh, this group right here, anything less than 500,000, that's pretty good. Uh, those are relatively low numbers of yeasts and silages. But look how many samples had higher than half a million. It's pretty high. And some of these silages had more than 250 million uh, yeast per, per gram of silage, which is really um, unacceptable and undesirable. And so what are the effects of feeding aerobically spoiled silage on the rumen and the cow? Um, first of all, let me start off with this slide. How many people, and um, I can't see you raising your hand or, or, or saying yes, but how many people know that we feed uh, good DFM probiotic live yeast, right? Um, these are uh, feed additives that we use to uh, increase the performance of our lactating cows. I just have an example here of something that's called Levucel. Okay, so Levucel is a Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, probiotic, directed microbial. It's used at a level of point, uh, 0 0.15 grams per cow per day. Okay, that is the equivalent if you were to, to, to figure out how many yeast you had in corn silage that was good, that it had 100,000 yeast per gram, that, was, that would be right around here. And let's, let's see what happens if you go to a corn silage that had 100 times more of these bad yeast or 10,000 times more of these bad yeast. You can see that in some instances, the number of bad yeast that you are feeding your cows coming from spoiled corn silage can be the equivalent of 1,500 <laughs> times the amount of good yeast that you fed to your cows. So if you believe that feeding a really small amount of good yeast can actually help the production efficiency of your cows, you have to be worried about feeding a huge amount of spoilage yeast and the potential that it has for negative effects on your cow. Here's a, a quick study that we had done uh, uh, several years ago where we isolated one of these spoilage yeasts from uh, uh, high moisture corn and dosed it back in vitro and looked at fiber digestibility after 12 hours in a TMR. And you can see that the higher amounts of yeast that we put in per mill of rumen fluid, that we saw a decline in fiber digestibility in this study. A study from the University of Wisconsin also fed moldy, yeasty, high moisture corn to lactating cows. And what they showed was a negative correlation in, with these cows over a 14 day period where they found that that when there was more molds in the total mix ration, milk production dropped in a negative um, uh, way. We also did a study uh, recently with uh, feeding uh, spoiled TMRs to heifers. So we had a, a TMR that was fed to some heifers. We also had that TMR and put it on a, on a pallet and let it spoil two to five days prior to feeding. And, we've, and so we fed half of the heifers, fresh TMRs made up every day, or heating TMRs that had temperatures as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. We looked at the composition of the fresh and spoiling TMRs, and you can see that uh, the pH is higher in the spoiling TMR, less lactic acid, um, less acetic, uh, but the big difference is that the spoiling TMR 
had a very high population of yeasts versus the fresh TMR only had about 100,000 versus 66 million. And that was basically the only difference between the two TMRs. And what we were able to find is that in the rumen of these animals that were fed spoiled TMR, you could still find spoilage yeasts in the rumen. The yeasts were active and metabolically alive in the rumen of these cows. And this caused a depression in dry matter intake. This is about a 13 to 14% decrease in intake because these, co these cows were, or heifers were fed the spoiling TMR. Um, some work with goats, and I know goats aren't necessarily the best model for lactating dairy cows, but this was a, a study done in Germany where they actually found that the change in temperature of the silage as it heated was negatively correlated with dry matter intake in goats. And so you can see here is that as a, the temperature of the silage mass increased by 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, that intake declined over time. So we know that um, this is really important and it's something that you probably should do, especially in the summertime, is to check the, the uh, when you're walking up and down the barns or the feed bunks, is to check the temperature of those TMRs uh, two or three hours after feeding and see if they're increased or hot. And the indications of aerobic spoilage and TMRs and silage are usually this, temperatures more than uh, 95 to uh, 100, 100 degrees. And this should be Fahrenheit. I, I apologize, this is a typo here. So this should be more than 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Reheating in the feed bunk, lack of a sharp acid or sweet smell, a musty moldy smell, or visible signs of mold. Those are all indications that your silage is aerobically spoiling, silage or TMR is, is spoiling. And do TMRs actually spoil? Um, actually, it was really interesting. Uh, several years ago, uh, uh, we asked uh, someone, you know, do, do, do total mixed rations uh, become unstable to the summer, in the summertime? And, so, and several people actually raised their hand and said, no, they don't. They're stable. My, my TMRs are stable all the time. And so we did a study over two years uh, in the Northeast where we sampled about um, uh, 24 different farms uh, right after them making their TMRs and measured instability. And what you can see here is that in both years, years one and two, more than half of the farms had total mixed rations that were spoiling in less than 12 hours within the feed bunk. So the answer is that yes, especially during the summer when things are hot, uh, total mixed rations do spoil and cause reductions in intake. And so what can you do to minimize the effects of aerobic stability in uh, mixed rations in the feed bunk? Well, first of all, you need to make sure that you remove sufficient silage from the silo to prevent spoilage ahead of time. You certainly don't wanna mix boiled silage with other feeds. You probably wanna mix and feed the TMR uh, two to three times a day. Mix only enough TMR to feed immediately. Um, if you must mix the TMR ahead of time, do so at night when it's cooler. And you could possibly use a total mix ration uh, TMR saver or preservative to uh, prevent further spoilage within the silo. I'm gonna show you uh, the results of a study that we had done uh, with an undergrad in my lab one summer, where we took fresh corn silage from our farm and spoiled it and ended up with fresh corn silage that you can see has low number of yeast, a low pH, and was stable for over 138 hours because this material was actually treated with an inoculant designed to improve stability. But we left this material in a pile and left it there long enough that this material started to spoil. And you can see that this material now had a pH that was very high. It had millions of yeast, millions of molds, and basically was not aerobically stable. And what we did was we took fresh corn silage and replaced that fresh corn silage with either 
Um, you can see here, uh, right here, we have 100% corn silage in a, in a total mix ration right here in the yellow. And you can see that when we mix fresh corn silage into a TMR, that TMR remains stable for hundreds of hours here, right? It, before it started to heat and increase. And then we mixed in old silage at 10%, old silage at 20%, old silage at 30%, and old silage of 40%. And now, however, if you look at the heating graphs, you'll see here that there's a really big change in the stability of these TMRs. And in fact, all of these TMRs now, even if they only had 10% of the spoiled silage mixed into them, they all spoiled in less than 24 hours. And, and so you can see, uh, in fact, 40% old silage spoiled in about five hours. So one of the things that you have to be very careful about is knocking down enough feed so that it doesn't spoil in the pad between mixing of TMRs. And also, um, I know that there are some people that will take waybacks and mix that into a TMR and feed it to maybe some dry cows or some heifers because they don't want to waste the food. Well, if you can, you can do that, but you're potentially contaminating a fresh TMR and causing it to potentially spoil very early uh, over time. Another question that comes up then is how do we minimize wild yeast in silage? I just talked about wild yeast in the TMRs. Um, and the first place to start is to make sure that we ensile forages at an optimum dry matter level. And this is really important because one of the things we know is that drier silages are more prone to, to result in higher numbers of yeast because they don't pack as well and there's more porosity within the silo, okay? Um, we want also to have excellent silage management. We'll talk about this, packing weights, face shavers, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, additives to minimize yeast as well. So let's focus on silage management then to keep wild yeast out of silages. We want to fill quickly, but not too quickly. Now, 15 years ago, folks, if you asked me, can we still fill silos too quickly? I would say, I would have said no. Today, the answer is yes. And you guys know that, especially the guys that are, have two, two choppers in the field and are going really fast. There's a really high probability that you can end up with um, uh, uh, packing too, too quickly. So fill quickly, pack tightly. Uh, I have numbers here that you can find in the literature and find through Cornell Extension. So I'm not gonna go through all the numbers, but definitely pack tightly and pack in small layers to make sure that you can dense, get density out really quickly. If you chop it, you must pack it. Chop forages are still respiring. Do not leave chop forages in wagons or piles overnight because this is what's gonna happen. Look at this. This is forage coming out of a forage wagon, sitting in the wagon at six, 12, and 24 hours. And even within 12 hours, we're over a million CFUs per gram of silage with, of, of yeast and molds within that, that forge wagon because this material, rather than ensiling, it is respiring and causing the growth of these spoilage microorganisms. We wanna keep the air out at the edges and seams as you see here, because this is where air can enter the silo. Thank you, April. We have to have sufficient numbers of tires. As you can see here, not enough. This, si this silo had too much plastic pulled back. And so all of this material, not only was it subjected to rain or snow and the sun, but it was obviously subjected to air, which started aerobic instability. Uh, here's an example of actually uh, having two layers of plastic, tires touching, but still having a massive layer of spoilage here and this was probably because the density of this layer was not enough and it was still too porous that it actually allowed air to enter that mass and cause this material to spoil. We certainly do not want to see silage covers that look like this. This is what I call chia pet covers. This is the appropriate time of year. We don't see these 
advertisements on TV anymore, but I'm sure there's a lot of you that are as old as I am that remember seeing those commercials, at, especially at Christmas time for Chia Pet Covers, <laughs> where people are actually here putting a, a crop of rye or barley or something on top, hoping that grows, and hope, hopefully that, that, that inhibits the air from getting into the mass. Folks, this doesn't work. So you want to have good tires, good seals, maybe oxygen barrier plastic, double plastic if that helps you, and have really good oxygen um, um, uh, inhibition from going into the silo. You also want to keep the plastic down at the feeding face to keep the air from entering underneath that plastic and the air billowing. And of course, to remove adequate amounts of, of silage from the face of the silo. Now, folks, there are there are there is no magic number here. Um, I have removed six to twelve inches a day, but it really depends on the weather and it depends on your packing density, right? During the winter, you can remove less. During the summer, you probably need to remove more, right? If you're drier, you probably need to remove more. But you want to keep that face clean and keep it clean so that you don't have a lot of silage sitting here. That's that's starting that. Um, a domino effect of lactate uh, assimilating yeast waking up and starting to spoil this material, especially in between mixing of total mix rations. Too many faces is not a good thing because now every face has increased the surface area for spoilage. And of course, the last thing I'm going to talk about is additives that we can use, use to control yeast. Um, for silages, Additives based on the l butneride bug have become quite popular. And we also have organic acids and combinations of these things that can be used for specifically for total mix rations. There are TMR savers that are out there, but these are a band-aid because remember that this silage could have spoiled before it even got into the TMR. So butneride is an interesting organism. Um, uh, it's been around for a long time. And it really was um, Rick Muck, uh, Rich Muck at the Forge Lab when he was still working at Wisconsin that discovered this microorganism. And this microorganism is great because what it can do is it can anaerobically, not aerobically, but anaerobically take a little bit of lactic acid and make acetic acid, which inhibits the yeast and molds and improves aerobic stability. And this is uh, a meta-analysis that we have done. It's, it's getting pretty old, but it does uh, drive home the point. I'm just going to draw your attention to this last line here of aerobic stability, where the control silages had aerobic stabilities of, of 20, about 25 hours versus those with the high level of Buchneri were stable for more than 500 hours. When are these additives most useful? I have listed them here. They include silages that are high in starch, especially things like snaplage, high moisture corn, cereal grains, anybody having bump life and heating TMR issues, challenges with silage removal uh, from silos, high dry matter silages. If you're moving silages, you might want to make treat ahead of time, uh, summer feed, prolonged storage, intermediate feeding piles. Those are all instances where you might want to make sure um, that uh, things are really, really great with your additives. Lastly, what we don't know about raw yeast. Well, we know that uh, yeast causes this instability that occur within the silo that it can affect the animals, but we don't really know specifically what they're doing in terms of producing toxic end products. We also don't know whether the yeast themselves are the problem or whether they're causing some other alteration in nutritive value. And simplistically, we don't know whether the negative effect that yeast have on our animals, is it really due to what we call organoleptic effects? Is it due because the cows don't like the taste, the smell, or the hot feel of this really um, uh, bad spoiling silage? We really don't know a lot of things here, but we do know that these silages are bad. And so in conclusion, all of these silages, all of these types of yeast that we find in silos, whether they're ethanol ferment uh, producers or aerobic stability uh, in initiators, 
they're all undesirable. Especially the lactate assimilators are bad because they initiate aerobic spoilage. And we know that spoiled and spoiling silages are associated with detrimental effects in animals. Again, we don't really know the, the direct cause of these detrimental effects, but we do know that if you have good silo management, and that would be the first place to start, you can help to minimize the yeast and minimize the chance that these silages will uh, go uh, unstable on you. Finally, various additives can be used to help in minimizing yeast and make sure that we use these um, judiciously. The take home messages are that we know that wild yeasts are undesirable. We know they have detrimental effects. We don't know the mechanisms, but we do know how to minimize their numbers. And with that, I will leave it to Paul and April to moderate. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lehman. Excellent. You gave us a really good insight on the new information that we really need to get our hands on in this area for managing quality forage. So I'm going to turn this part of the session over to Paul um, to monitor the questions that come through. We, we don't have a whole lot of time, but we have some. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> 